Thank you. And uh, I want to thank the Academy and the Chancellor and the President for giving me this opportunity and giving me this honor. I'm only sorry that I missed the first day. So I have a little brief presentation on our work. Um, I came, uh, I, don't, I don't think I need it because I have uh, the computer here. So I did my training at Johns Hopkins as an MD, PhD. I, I never pursued medicine and I went to the Whitehead eventually as a, a Whitehead fellow and eventually joined the Whitehead. And now I'm a, a professor at the Whitehead Institute, MIT, and an investigator of HHMI. I've actually worked on a problem since I was a graduate student. When I was a graduate student, Saul Snyder identified this protein here called mTOR, which we now, is know, know, now we know is part of a, of a major pathway in regulating growth. And so one of the main interests of our lab has been this growth problem, and very simply put, this is how a cell takes nutrients from its environment, generates mass, and increases in size, or at the organismal level, how an animal takes food and increases in, in size. Surprisingly, we hadn't known much about how this worked until a couple of decades ago, and we now appreciate that this system, this mTOR pathway, is really a major driver of growth. Now, insight into this system actually comes from an interesting direction, a small molecule, rapamycin, which is now actually a fairly well-known molecule. This uh, molecule also has an interesting history. It comes from Easter Island. A soil sample there revealed a bacterium that made Easter, it makes uh, rapamycin. That's where its name comes. Rapa Nui is the indigenous name for, for uh, Easter Island. This is where you have these large statues. Uh, I went there actually two years ago to find this plaque. There's a plaque that's placed on the island where rapamycin was actually recovered. Unfor unfortunately, that plaque has since been, been uh, uh, stolen. Uh, this actually has some interesting clinical uses shown here, first as an immunosuppressant, then in cardiology, now in anti-cancer uh, space as well. But what's made rapamycin, taking it from the biomedical uh, world, the research world, more to the lay audience, is that rapamycin is probably the best characterized compound for prolonging lifespan in model organisms. And when one thinks about the effects of science on society, one of the themes of this meeting, clearly changing lifespan and health span, as, as Helen talked about, would have major impacts. Um, indeed, this has captivated even the lay audience. For example, this is a popular press magazine in the United States, Bloomberg Magazine. You can see this woman here celebrating her 173rd birthday after taking a version of rapamycin actually made uh, by Novartis. We now appreciate that this molecule acts by inhibiting this pathway. We call the mTOR pathway, specifically a sub-branch of it, a complex that we defined a number of years ago we call mTOR complex 1. And we appreciate that this complex, which is a protein kinase, regulates almost any process in the cell that either generates or consumes large amounts of energy. So things like autophagy, which is where the cell breaks itself down, biogenesis of ribosomes, they account for about 50% of the energy use of a cell. And we appreciate now that the system senses pretty much anything you can do to a cell, any kind of nutrient, energy source, growth factor, stress, somehow this pathway knows about this and reacts to it. And this is part of the evidence telling us that the cell cares a lot about controlling the mTORC1 pathway. And we focused over the last 10 years or so on the upstream signals, as I'll show you in a second. Let me prove to you first that this is a growth pathway. What we're using here is the mouse liver as a model. Here's a normal liver, uh, normal pathway activity. Here we've inhibited the pathway genetically or we've activated it genetically. And you can see this about 40% change in size of the liver, either down or up. What's actually more interesting, though, is if you take these animals and you fast them. In a mouse, you can fast for about 48 hours before it gets very sick and, and, and really does, doesn't live much longer. And if you do this, almost all tissues shrink. The only tissue that we find does not shrink is the brain. The liver loses about 40% of its mass during that period of time. But if you look at these two livers, either the inhibited liver or the activated liver in terms of the mTORC1 pathway, these livers don't shrink. And this is part of the evidence that this is one of the main pathways in tying the availability of nutrients in the environment to physiology, in this case, liver growth. And so the way that we think about this system now in a very big picture way, it is the pathway that helps determine whether a tissue in an organism is either in an anabolic state, that is generating mass, or a catabolic state, breaking down mass and releasing its components. We've been particularly fixated on trying to understand how this pathway senses nutrients, because at the end of the, way, end of the day, mass is made from nutrients, and we need carbon and nitrogen sources, as well as many other uh, elements to, to make mass. And so we focused on how it senses nutrients. 
We didn't know anything about this. It was a complete black box until we obtained movies like this. And I'm, I'm embarrassed to show this in front of, of Eric, but for us, this was nevertheless an insightful uh, movie. What you're looking at is mTORC1 in human cells in the absence of nutrients. And the nutrients we're using here are amino acids. But you could do the same thing with other nutrients like glucose or cholesterol, for example. And what you see is that mTORC1, this large protein complex, is in this very diffuse pattern in the cell. This is the nucleus of the cell. This is the cytoplasm. And you see when you add nutrients, really within minutes, it moves to these punctate structures. And this is a fully reversible uh, path uh, system. You can remove the nutrients and it comes back off. And so there's a correlation between the movement and the activation. Eventually, we figured out what these were, and they turned out to be lysosomes. And this led to this model, which we've largely shown to be true now, where mTORC1 translocates to the surface of the lysosome. And this is this organelle that, that Eddie de Roberti has introduced to you before, a highly catalytic, a catabolic uh, organelle uh, originally discovered by Christian de Duve. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. We've now spent a lot of time trying to figure out the components of this arrow. It could have been very simple. There could have been a kinase that simply binds amino acids and regulates this. It turns out it's not very simple. There's about 30 or so proteins we've discovered that seem to be involved in this movement. We first found that there's a pathway coming from inside the lysosome. And this had a profound impact on the field of lysosome biology because it meant that the lysosome was not simply a place you broke things down, but actually it was a signaling organelle that was sending signals to the cytosol. And we've identified how that happened. We then found why this movement happened because it turns out there's an activator on the surface of the lysosome. And more recently, we found that there's a whole cytosolic pathway for also sensing uh, nutrients. And so as you can see, this is a very complicated system. So each, each of these are large protein complexes. For us, the, the really important piece of the system has been what are the sensors? That is, which are the proteins that directly bind the nutrients to convey the signals? None of these proteins are, are those, those sensors. We've now identified about seven or so of them, and I won't show you much of the details of that, except to say that some of them we've managed to now crystallize with their cognates, their ligands inside of them. So for example, we now have the leucine sensor. Leucine is one of the most common amino acids and proteins. We have the sensor for it. You can see leucine bound here. We've also identified one of the arginine sensors. Arginine is one of the most nitrogen-rich amino It actually is the most nitrogen-rich amino acid. And it, it works with this protein that we named castor. And in fact, it's a dimer. It has two arginine binding sites. So we're quite excited about potentially taking advantage of these sensors to drug this pathway, either for cancer uses or really in the more fanciful ways, even for sort of anti-aging or sort of slowing of aging type molecules. Because if we could mimic the absence of nutrients without having to actually not uh, eat, which is, is obviously difficult to do or to fast, this would be greatly advantageous. So if we take a step back, though, this pathway drives mTORC1 to the surface of the lysosome. As I told you, this has really impacted in how we think about the lysosome. And so a large part of the lab now has become interested in this organelle per se and some of its biology. And the lysosome is quite interesting. We've known about it for decades, but we're now having a reappreciation of how important it is for regulating metabolism in the cell. In many ways, you can think of the lysosome as the stomach of the cell. It takes components inside through the autophagy pathway, components from the outside. Eddie also talked about this through macropinocytosis, micropinocytosis, or through just general endocytosis, or the endomembrane pathway. They all end up in the lysosome. The lysosome, in a way, is the terminal organelle in the cell. This is where, basically, things end up. And it, if things work well, actually get destroyed. And so if you're thinking about nutrients, the lysosome is a key organelle. And it makes a lot of sense now in retrospect that we put this major nutrient sensor on the surface of the lysosome. The problem with studying the lysosome is that it's only about 2 to 3 percent of the cell volume. So if you want to study metabolites, proteins inside the lysosome, if you look at the whole cell, it's very hard to see this. And so we've been developing new methods now to rapidly capture different organelles and metabolite profile them. And so we've been deorphaning different human diseases that have lysosome connection. We recently deorphaned de a disease that the gene's been known for 30 years, and yet we didn't know what it did by looking inside the lysosome. We're studying the lysosome in aging. There's actually interesting connections of it. And so it's become a, a point of interest for the lab. Another direction that we've been going in is one of the more obvious ones that it's funny, there are things that happen in biology that you sort of take for granted and then realize you don't understand the mechanistic basis of it. As I mentioned to you, if you fast an animal, the organs shrink. The cells actually shrink in size. If you inhibit the mTORC1 pathway, organ cells shrink in size. I never really thought much about how this happened. I always imagined, well, you break things down and therefore you shrink uh, the cell. But if you think about, for example, shrinking a building such as this, it wouldn't be so easy to do that. You'd have to go and cut the beams in the building. You'd have to keep the walls intact, particularly a cell that you need to keep functioning 
during this shrinking process. And so we've started to realize that there must be a cell shrinking program within the cell. And in particular, we've started focusing on the cytoskeleton of the cell, the intermediate filament cytoskeleton of the cell, because we've realized that this is setting up the rigidity and the structure of the cell. And we've now started to find the pathways by which you go and induce the breaking of this to actually shrink the cell. And again, I'm analogizing it to the cytoskeleton of a cell. And so we think this will be an interesting area connecting cell biology as well as nutrient sensing and overall response to, uh, to fasting. And with that, I'll close and just thank that there's many people who've worked on nutrient sensing in my lab, and some of the ones that I, uh, I, I some of the work I highlighted is shown by the, the people in the larger images. And so, thank you very much. Are there questions to that nice presentation? Yep, please. You spoke about these amino acid sensors for arginine and for leucine. Yeah. At what level do they work? Is it in the cytoplasm, in the lysosome? Yeah, the, the two that I highlighted. So we have, we, we have sensors now for arginine, leucine, methionine, and lysine. And, uh, and all of them work in the cytosol except the arginine sensor. So this is, there's two arginine sensors. I showed you the cytosolic arginine sensor, and for whatever reason, there's also a lysosomal arginine sensor. It's a transmembrane protein. And we think the reason for this is that ribosomes are very high in, in arginine and lysine because they're RNA binding proteins. And they are amongst the most common things destroyed by the cell in response to fasting because they account for such a large part of the mass of the cell. And so in a way, arginine sensor sensing is, is a way of detecting the destruction of ribosomes, which, as you know, contains a large amount of the nucleic acid in a cell. So if you have to recycle nucleic acids, RNA, you want to know when they're being broken down. And so we have cytosolic and lysosomal sensors so far. We know a couple of other amino acids are sensed, but we don't know what the sensors are. Other questions? Okay, please. This is just common sense, but I was wondering if water loss could, be a, a, could play a role in the shrinking of the tissues. Yeah, so, so clearly you know, changes in, in cell density are going to have an impact on, on the size. But when, when I mean growth, we're looking at amount of protein, in essence, is what we use, sometimes RNA. So there's less protein per cell. So it's, it's really an active loss of, of mass, not simply dilution effects, which, which of course you, you could have as well. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. I was informed that the other two uh, awardees received their medal from the Pope recently, and I just ask you to come over here and I will hand over your medal with my best wishes for your future scientific activities. <laughs>